everyone. Sorry I couldn't make class this week. Uh, I'm actually traveling right now. I'm down in Atlanta. Uh, but I wanted to go ahead and put together a, a deck for, for you guys. So Dr. Lee didn't have to present for me. I thought I'd just record a video and kind of step through what I came up with uh, for this week's assignment. Specifically applying Checklin soft system methodology to uh, the high speed um, internet conundrum in the U.S. that was put forward by NPR. Um, so just a, a brief overview of, of the, the problem as it's seen by Susan Crawford, who's a, a telecommunications policy expert um, that was interviewed in this, in this uh, NPR interview. But basically, she, she points to the fact that U.S. high-speed internet access is not considered a common carriage service like phone or water or electricity, so it's not regulated by the FCC. Um, Michael Powell, the former FCC chairman, actually removed that designation from Internet Access as a service, um, effectively deregulating it and allowing uh, telco companies to decide uh, how to invest, who should have access, um, what kind of infrastructure they lay, what kind of prices they'll charge, that sort of thing. Um, and, the, and the argument or the point is that other developed nations have actually uh, considerably faster speeds at fractions of the cost than what it is in America. Um, and obviously that's sort of problematic um, from many different angles, but um, it could be argued that it would stifle creativity and innovation, among other things. Um, and then you also end up with um, citizens of the United States, uh, maybe in more rural areas or in areas that are less densely populated that can't achieve the same level of high speed and certainly can't do it at the cost uh, or at a reasonable cost. Um, she points to, uh, Susan Crawford uh, points to the political arms of teleco companies um, and their capacity to basically disincentivize regulation of internet access. Um, obviously, we, we all kind of are familiar how the political system works. It's, it's the idea of pay to play. So um, if the telco companies can, can pay uh, politicians um, and policymakers not to regulate high-speed internet access, then they'll be left to their own uh, devices, so to speak, and they'll be able to set policy um, and prices and, and, and make their own determination about who should have access and at what speed. Um, obviously, Susan Crawford sort of represents the advocate uh, for U.S. high-speed internet access in, in this sort of situation, and her goal is basically trying to uh, raise awareness. And again, she's arguing that it's cheaper and better uh, in other countries, other developed countries, um, and that the lack of, of uh, high-speed internet access in the United States is going to stifle development ingenuity, among other things. Um, so for the purpose of the assignment, we're going to try and apply the soft systems methodology to this particular problem situation. Um, and Checkland does a really nice job of defining soft systems methodology. Uh, the overall use of, of SSM can be thought of as an intervention in human situation which uh, has arisen among a group of people in a particular setting in order to find accommodations which will enable action to improve the situation to be taken. So the idea, or at least my view of the idea, is that if you can understand the perspective, the worldview of the different sides of the problem situation and how they see the problem and how, um, obviously how they see the problem will shape what they think the resolution should be. But the idea behind SSM is that if you can... Um, if you can accurately see and understand and represent all the perspectives that are coming to the table of those that are involved or those that have the capacity to make change, um, a sensible debate or a sensible discussion can be had uh, about how to improve the situation. So the remainder of this deck is just going to walk through uh, essentially what my paper um, relayed in terms of applying the SAW systems methodology or, or pieces of it to uh, this high-speed internet access problem that we were just talking about. Um, so there's kind of three analysis that the paper walks through. Analysis one uh, sort of focuses on the history of the problem. I mean, ostensibly, you can't solve a problem if you don't know anything about the problem, where it came from, why it exists, that sort of thing. So Checklin's uh, analysis one really focuses on who or what has caused the problem to take place, um, who is already attempting to address the problem, and then also who may be considered to be the owner of the problem. And I think as I was sort of alluding to a moment ago, the important thing to remember here is that the answers to these questions are completely predicated on a worldview, not, not the worldview, not an actual worldview um, necessarily,
but my worldview or um, you know anybody that's answering these questions. In this particular case, it's obviously my worldview, um, but there are many worldviews out there, not just mine. And if you ask somebody else, they might see something very differently. Um, so if we're to if we're to walk through these particular questions uh, with respect to um, the U.S. high-speed internet access issues that we're talking about, uh, perhaps we come up with something that looks like this. Um, I think the initial cause and effect, right, is probably Michael Powell. So when he deregulated the high-speed internet access industry, um, that was sort of the initial uh, blow or the initial cause of the problem. Um, but that was just the initial cause of the problem. I think now the problem is a little more systemic in the sense of, of it's ongoing. It's, it's what's been done has been done, but it can be undone. Um, if we didn't have this other problem in the way. And then the other problem that I see is the capacity of lobbying arms and telco companies to persuade um, the political system, the American political system. And this is not something new. I mean, there are all kinds of challenges, um, special interest groups, that sort of thing, um, can take up in order to either uh, shape American policy or, or legislation or um, get it changed um, in their favor, et cetera. So, um, the idea that uh, lobbyists or these these massive telecommunications companies who have very very deep pockets can pay uh, and and line the pockets and uh, and the election campaigns of um, of political figures in America means that they will inherently gain control of the situation. They can uh, essentially you know shape the actions and the legislation and the policy that gets created by by the elected officials in America um, by giving them money, essentially, uh, which is which is no secret, right? Um, so where I kind of place the cause, the ongoing cause of the problem is really the American political system um, because it, it's structured in such a way that it allows these kinds of things to go on. Um, in terms of what's being done already, uh, Susan Crawford mentioned that some municipalities are starting to take uh, matters into their own own hands, so to speak. So, like Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Boston are all examples that she she lists that um, local government there is is using their resources and, frankly, their political capital um, to to try and remedy this problem and create solutions that uh, or an environment that creates opportunity for solutions that provide high speed internet access at significantly less of, of a cost. With respect to who owns the problem, um, since I'm kind of pointing to the idea that the American political system is the problem, ultimately, um, I'd like to believe that the American people have the power to change the political system. Um, I don't know how, how pie in the sky that is, but um, technically, we have the power to decide who gets into office, uh, who our elected officials are. And so uh, I think technically, we are, we are endowed with the power to, to remedy this problem if we see the problem as the American political system. So, um, you know, if we can vote in um, elect, uh, elected officials that um, are interested in changing campaign regulation or, you know, the, the effect that um, special interest groups can have on elections or on policy, then we effectively have the power to change um, or to create a, to, to change the process in order to create a solution that works in this scenario or for this problem situation. Analysis two um, of Checklin's um, SSM really is focused on the environmental context. So, can we understand the problem situation as it exists um, with respect to the norms, the social norms, the values held by people, the roles they play in the problem context? Um, and so, the idea is that. Um, we can sort of see the perspective of those that uh, proliferate the problem. So whether that means the telco companies or um, the American people or elected officials. Um, and then we could also talk about those that are affected by the problem, again, back to the American people. Um, and so the idea is that we can get some sort of context as to why people are doing what they're doing um, or believing what they're believing or acting how they're, they're acting uh, as it relates to the problem. So. A little table here uh, of the way that I see it um, is that there are really five groups of, of people um, that that sort of build this social construct or this social social context that um, this problem exists inside of. Um, the first group would be the telco companies, and, and in terms of role, they sort of serve as the internet service provider, which is kind of obvious. If we're looking at their values or their primary values, their primary value, the primary goal is to maximize their profits. And so if they can maximize their profits, by manipulating um, 
who has access to what content and who they partner with and is their partner's content and their partner's infrastructure or their partner's solutions or their own solutions um, pushed forward uh, above um, other things, should we say, right? Um, then obviously that's what they're going to do if it maximizes profit, which also motivates them to, to, to affect this whole idea of lobbying and, and paying to play with elected officials. If they can buy their, their policy, then they'll do that. Um, it's, a, it's probably a, an insignificant cost in the scheme of things. If they can get uh, policy set their way at, at a certain cost that will maximize their profits, uh, essentially they'll come out on top. Elected officials, um, so they're the legislators, right, or, and, and the, uh, the folks that appoint um, appointed officials, um, but I think their primary values are, are ideally self-preservation and maintaining their position in government. Um, and this idea of self-preservation and and staying, keeping their job in government, basically creates um, incentive for them to accept contributions from telco companies, um, so that they can get reelected, so that they can run more ad campaigns, so that they can do all the things that they want to do, or that they think they did, they need to do in order to get elected. But obviously, um, the the result of that taking money from the telco companies is that then they act on behalf of the telco companies. Um, they also uh, appoint puppet officials that are going to do uh, what they say or what they require. So FCC chairman, um, attorney general, all, all of these things, uh, these these are politically appointed positions um, that those people are then beholden to these legislators and these elected officials and um, are basically coerced into doing what they want them to do. Um, obviously, there's a, appointed officials we're just speaking of, right? They're re making policy. Um, so their their goals are, or their, va their primary values are very similar, self-preservation, maintaining their position in government. And they're going to basically perform as instructed by the elected officials who have appointed them, right? They want to keep their job. If they don't do what they're told, then they'll lose their job ostensibly. Um, there's also the advocates for, for enhanced ISP internet. So this would be the Susan Crawfords of the world, and I've kind of labeled them as the, the idea that they're the whistleblower. So their goal is to make American people cognizant of the, the poor internet access that we have, um, and this causes them to go and do interviews with NPR or um, write or um, interview, you know, basically to um, raise awareness um, in their community, in the national community, and so on. Um, and then the American people, if I've affectionately labeled as sheep, um, their their primary values are self-importance and self-focus. They don't see outside of their their sphere of influence. A lot of them, um, they don't uh, they don't stand on principles when they're inconvenient. Largely, um, this is very cynical. Obviously, um, I think individual people, a person does do some of these things, but people on the whole, um, they tend to prioritize certain things um, when they vote and. Um, or when they when they put elected officials in office, and perhaps this uh, isn't one of them. Uh, this idea of high speed internet access, and um, I mean, there's any litany of other of other issues that could take precedence, obviously. Um, but in the context of this solution or this problem situation, I mean, um, their self importance and self focus has has caused them to effectively ignore the greater good. Um, and it remain oblivious to the deficiency. I think many people don't even know that we are paying significantly more money for significantly poor service compared to other developed nations. So this would be my version of, of Checkland's analysis too. Um, this is sort of the context and the environment uh, that I see this, this problem existing inside of. Analysis three is really trying to understand the power um, in, in the situation and how it manifests itself. Um, obviously, understanding the power structure has implications for potential solutions. So um, as long as one group has power, um, the ability to change the solution or the narrative um, is diminished for other groups. And so the analysis um, in this scenario or in this problem situation is that ultimately uh, the American people hold power um, because we're the ones that get to determine who holds elected office. Um, if we're assuming that the American political system is the problem um, and, and the ultimate problem um, for why we're so deficient with respect to internet access, um, the American people ultimately hold the responsibility of changing that because the, the fundamental problem, again, is the lobbying arms and the money that comes into um, 
elected officials um, through companies with special interests. Uh, but because the American people fail to use their quote unquote proper um, application of that power that they have to put elected people in office, um, essentially what's happened now is that the telco companies and their deep wallets are in the position of power. So they can buy policy um, through the, the American political system because of the American people's inability to um, address this particular situation head on. So those are the three analysis um, from, from Checkwin's perspective or from Checkwin Soft Systems methodology and my perspective, the way that I see the problem. Um, if we were to assume that there is a, or if I were to presume the worldview that a successful marketplace can be operated, which makes available high-speed internet access, and it can do it for a mass market, and if that worldview were motivated by a mission statement that said we wanted to make uh, high-speed internet access at prices low enough to enable uh, most Americans to afford them, um, if that's my worldview and, and I sort of set aside a lot of the, the issues and stuff that I've just kind of been talking about, um, we could basically build an SSM style model to represent that worldview. And so here's my version of that model. And the way I see it, there are really two key players. Um, there's the state government and there's an internet service provider. I say it's the Stockholm model because Crawford uh, actually mentions uh, in the NPR interview how Stockholm uh, went about standing up their uh, high speed internet access, which I think is, I think what I remember is it was 18 times faster than our high speed internet, and it's a quarter of the cost to the consumer. Um, and so, what I've basically done is I've taken the Stockholm model um, and I've, I've sort of framed it in this soft systems methodology uh, model um, that you see right here. So, if we were to step through this, um, essentially, um, let's start with the state government here, the blue box. Uh, the first thing they have to do, or the first thing they could do, um, is fundraise via a bond program. And that's what Stockholm did. They sold bonds to uh, raise capital, essentially crowdsourcing um, the infrastructure for the high-speed internet. And it's fire, fiber lines, I'm not sure exactly what they did. But they used the bond program to raise money um, so that they could put the infrastructure in place. So once they had the money raised through the bond program, they implemented uh, a fiber network or a high-speed network in their municipality. I'm suggesting that um, you know we take this at the state level and so we would implement a fiber network in a densely popula populated geographic area. If that's Virginia, then maybe Northern Virginia would be a good candidate. Uh, Richmond, Norfolk, Newport News area um, are all densely populated areas. And the reason to do that is just simply to um, basically boost revenue streams from um, this model that we're describing here as quickly as possible so that that money can be used to repay the bond program, which you see as number two, um, but also to reinvest into other areas of the state. Um, and, and basically the idea is that we could, after some time, build out the infrastructure we need at a state level to have um, high-speed internet access infrastructure. Um, once they do, uh, once the infrastructure is in place, right, number three, um, it would be to design, decide, decide price of access um, to the network and the idea is that they would, number four, lease access to this high-speed internet um, infrastructure to internet service providing companies. Um, and then those companies can turn around and sell to consumers. Um, number five, they're going to collect uh, revenue from these ISPs that they're uh, leasing the access to. Um, and then ultimately, number 10 there uh, is, is the state is going to provide access to the fiber network to these ISPs. So basically, um, the ISP would serve as a middleman. Um, they would make money um, off of um, selling access to the state government or the state-ran um, fiber infrastructure. And they could charge customers whatever they wanted to charge, but there would be other uh, competitions. So that would drive prices down for consumers, um, effectively reducing cost and providing access to um, high-speed uh, infrastructure. But if we were to t step through sort of the ISP perspective of this problem um, or this solution, potential solution, um, number six, they would obviously subscribe to the fiber network lease. So they would go to the state and they'd say, hey, I want to be an internet service provider. Um, and they'd sign up and they'd agree to pay whatever the state decided they want to charge. Um, once they have the lease set up, they can decide the price of fiber access for their customers. So again, they're the middleman. So they can mark up the access or 
or I'm sorry, mark up the, the cost for the consumer so that they're making revenue as well. Um, but at least some percentage of that uh, would, would go back to uh, pay for the lease access. Um, and so they're going to decide the price of fiber access for the company for the customer, and then they're obviously going to market their access to potential customers. And then number nine, there they're going to deliver the high-speed internet access to the consumer. And so the idea is that now we'll have uh, high-speed, ultra high-speed internet access at the prices um, that are driven down, hopefully by competition amongst many ISPs that are using the same infrastructure provided by the state. Um, and then number 11 there, uh, obviously they have to pay for, for their access to the state government's fiber network. Um, 12, 13, and 14 are sort of staples of Chequin's um, soft system methodology where uh, you would want to define criteria for effect, efficacy, efficiency, and effectiveness of the entire model, of the entire solution. Uh, you would monitor that, so we're monitoring steps 0 through 11. And then if things get off or can be improved or if there's ways to make it better or more efficient or more effective, um, you can take action to, to basically manipulate um, the system or the solution. So there's my model, uh, proposed model. I think um, it's, it's, like I said, it's largely based on what I would imagine or how this went down for Stockholm, um, but I don't see why this wouldn't work for the U.S. as well, or at least for the state. Um, so in concluding, this is obviously just one perspective. Like I said at the onset, um, there are lots of different perspectives. Um, this is just mine, and, and it's just one. Um, so there, there are certainly other worldviews that would drive um, a different perspective on the problem and even dirt different solution of, of the problem as well. Um, yeah, so... Um, Hope you guys are enjoying your Friday. Uh, I'll wrap up right here. Um, enjoy your Friday and uh, and have a nice weekend. I will be uh, in Atlanta over the weekend, but we'll be back and see you guys next week. Right, take care. <laughs>